Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching today. We're so excited to be here with Susan Wiggs, and uh, she has a brand new book coming out, um, The Oysterville Sewing Circle. Um, it is not out yet. Sorry, actually, Susan, when does it come out exactly? It comes out on August 13th, so a week from today, a week from when I'm talking to you, and um, so I'm just starting to get myself organized to go out and promote my book. So thank you so much for having me. This is really this is really cool that I get to, um, you know, meet people from afar like that. Well, we're so thrilled. Um, you are an absolute legend. So it's very exciting to talk to you. You have written almost 40 books. Is that right? Uh, yeah, no more. Um, I, I, I kind of stopped counting because I, I thought, gosh, I must just be a life support system for a, you know, for a manuscript. But I have been at it since um, 1986 was when I sold my first book. And I published, and that published in 1987. And I published a book or two ever since. So um, it's been my calling in life. It's been really gratifying to be able to do this. Well, that's absolutely incredible. And um, they're all very, very different. I've read a couple of them. Um, Map of the Heart mm -hmm. is one of the biggest ones. Is that right? Yes. Oh my God, that one. Uh, I think it was out two years ago originally. And um, I still get a lot of really great feedback from readers. They love the World War II. They love the lavender fields. They love the single mom grieving widow and, you know, all the, the, storylines that pull at your heartstrings. So that one, and then Oysterville kind of follows that thread. Then I, I call it Oysterville, the Oysterville sewing circle, I should call it, um, follows my, my interest in women's friendships and, uh, you know, career paths that people might take and choices they make in their lives. And so that seems to be at the core of most of my books. Well, that is very good for us because that's kind of at the core of us as well. So, <laughs> Good, good. I love book groups. I, I belong to a couple and I, I love the interchange. You know, you make a friend through a book so often. And, you know, I've met some of my favorite people in life just through the books that I've read and book groups. Very cool. Well, um, let's go back to start with. You, you were actually a Harvard graduate and tell us about your, the journey you were on to become an author. I, I will. It goes all the way back to the dawn of time. I was always a storyteller <laughs> when I was a little kid. Uh, even before I could read or write, I would, I would scribble on paper and dictate to my mother. And she was very patient. She would write down my stories and encourage me in that way. And, you know, I wrote coming up through school. Um, we did live overseas um, during my school age years, all the way through high school. And so um, it was a bit of an unusual background in that regard, and it kind of piqued my curiosity about the world. And so that's one reason that my books probably take place all over the globe. So um, the new one, The Oysterville Sewing Circle, is one of the few that I've written that take place in my home state of Washington. But I was a teacher right out of um, graduate school, right out of Harvard, um, and I loved my teaching career. Um, I actually taught math um, most years, and then um, the writing sort of took over. I was always, you know, I was writing at night and on the weekends, between night feedings with my little girl, and, and um, kind of made my way into publishing that way. And my early books were historical romance novels, the ones that people call bodice rippers. And, you know, they were very exciting and adventurous. And, um, you know, they had the, the beautiful overblown cover art. And then um, I sort of, my interest and my maturity sort of went along. And um, I, I just sort of followed my heart into this niche in fiction where I'd love to tell, um, stories about people like you and me, um, you know, making their way through life and, you know, the, all the drama that comes with that. So that's kind of been um, my direction. And I write um, probably a book a year. That's kind of my pace. So that's why I've been pretty prolific through the years. Absolutely. And they're, I mean, they're not novellas. These are, these are like real. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. They, the, the word count is, is high. And yet I, I often hear from readers that, you know, they read my book in a weekend or, you know, in one sitting or something, 
which is good news, bad news. The good news is I wrote a page turner and I held somebody's attention, but the bad news is then, you know, it's another year before I come out with another one. Okay, so what do we need to know specifically about this book? This book, um, a couple things, a, a little bit of background. It's, a, it's the first book that I've written with um, a new editor that I work with at um, William Morrow Books. It's the imprint that I write for at HarperCollins. Her name's Rachel and she's fantastic. And it was kind of a breath of fresh air to work with a woman, um, a, a like-minded woman. She's, um, she's a young mom. She's very stylish. She's very fabulous. And, um, and very focused on stories of, of women and, um, you know, contem very contemporary of the moment stories. And the, it was sort of an odd confluence of events as I was writing the book. I had, you know, I usually plan my books and, and um, plot them out and decide what they're going to be about a whole year before I actually write them. And so I had this amazing story and it was all it's always amazing in my head <laughs> till I ruin it by writing it down but um, I had it all plotted out in my head and um, it had to do with there, there are um, storylines of domestic violence and workplace harassment and things like that that we weren't hearing anything about and then as I was writing it this sort of me too movement just started like a, a forest fire and and it swept you know every time I would I would turn on the news or my email or something like that there would be more stories and so then in the world at work at home in their marriages with their partners and so it, it really kind of informed the book and that's why a lot of the passion in the book probably came from that while I was writing it and I said it in um, a, a, a small town about a big city girl she you know goes to the city to seek her fortune you know it's very much like a parable in that way and um ends up in a situation where she has to go back to her hometown and reinvent herself and she's suddenly in charge of these two small children after a horrible tragedy and how does she reinvent herself and who does she reconnect with and who rejects her and what does she discover about this kind of idyllic hometown that was um overly idealized in her mind and when she gets back she finds um, through the lens of her life experience that all is not as it seemed to her as a child and so she's reinventing herself and and you know meeting her town once again and her friends and she decides to form a women's group um, centered around support for people who are experiencing domestic violence and harassment and things like that. And uh, she's a apparel designer and an apparel producer. And so she names it the Oysterville Sewing Circle, thinking it was kind of a, a nondescript name that, um, you know, stalkers wouldn't really focus on. <laughs> sure. Well, I've only read part of it so far, but I am well and truly hooked. And I can't mm -hmm. wait to finish it. <laughs> and I recommend that as soon as it comes out next week that everybody picks up a copy, of course. Mm -hmm. um, let's explore um, you as an author. Well, sorry, not even as an author, as a person, really. Um, I yeah. want to know what, in your opinion, um, makes a great book and what elements do a great story possess? What makes a great book? Oh my gosh, I have to think about the great books. Um, I'm thinking a lot just today about Toni Morrison, the amazing American woman of letters who um, passed away yesterday. And I feel, you know, I've never met her. I don't know her. I've, of course, read many of her, much of her work, but she was my mother's favorite author. She was born the same year as my mother. So I feel kind of connected to her and she was just so powerful. And I think the thing that made her books great and the thing that makes any book great and the thing that I strive for as an author is to speak from your heart in this very authentic voice in a way that will resonate with your reader. And the books that are near and dear to me all have a, a unique voice and um, a really powerful theme, you know, embedded in a dramatic story. So for me, that's that makes it great. And um, I, I, 
find those books every day. One of the great frustrations of being an author is we don't get enough time to read. So um, hopefully I'll find myself some downtime and, and get some reading done the rest of the summer. On that note, actually, I'm just curious, do you read books that are in your same genre to sort of inspire you or do you leave the genre just to escape? I, I, I do both. I love a really good, um, you know, page turning, pulse pounding thriller. Um, that's not my genre. And in my genre, um, I have so many favorites. You know, there's a reason that I write what I write and it's because I love to read it. So I'm always, I've always got a book going. I try to, you know, read current books. I don't always, you know, get the time. I used to read the classics a lot more regularly, but there's, you know, so much new material out there to read that I'm, um, I'm always getting distracted by, by what's new and what's coming up. So I'm kind of a, a switch hitter in that way. Absolutely. And if you're not writing or perhaps reading, what are you doing? Oh, what am I doing? Um, I live on a little island in Puget Sound, um, right on the water. So there's like a little beach in front of the house. And um, we do a lot of hiking and biking. My husband, Jerry, is, is he's fantastic. He's my best friend. Jerry and I and the two dogs, we're hiking, we're biking, we're kayaking, boating, you know, doing all the outdoorsy stuff because it definitely is, um, you're sort of chained to your, your writing chair, I would say desk, but I don't, work much at a desk. Uh, so yeah, and I love to travel. I always try to travel to the setting of whatever book I happen to be working on. And so um, that's one reason my books take place in, in, in France and in Italy and Sonoma and, you know, all the beautiful places of the world that I, I love to explore. It sort of creeps its way into the narrative, I think. So, and Jerry's, um, he was actually a big part of the Oysterville Sewing Circle because he is a, he's a professional award-winning apparel designer. And so he was my touchstone for Caroline in the book. She's a, she's an aspiring designer, very talented. And so I kind of learned the ins and outs of the business. The little bits that you read in the, in the book are actually things that Jerry, you know, insights Jerry's given me. And so um, he's got a line of kids wear that um, is sold off his website and then he works for clients. And um, it's a, it's a very varied um, and much more interesting job. And, you know, I, I always think other people have jobs more interesting than sitting and writing. So that was really fun to be able to bring him into the process a little bit. So I will admit, I actually researched your husband's kids line and I, mm -hmm. I so curious what's in the pocket. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. Yes, so um, he's always been, his, his big stock and trade is outdoor wear. Um, there's a big label in Seattle called Outdoor Research and they make parkas and adventure wear and climbing gear and things like that. And so he's always been preoccupied with um, garments that have a little something extra so the little kids vest that he made has little sewn on backpack pockets and they I can saw them yeah. they're adorable <laughs> they're super cute yep so yeah he has those and then um and then he created um a t-shirt that that's more than a t-shirt and it's sort of it, and it is featured it makes a little cameo appearance in the book because my character caroline is trying to um assimilate these these two little kids there I think they're in kindergarten and first grade in the book he's and so she makes them some shirts to wear to school that you know will make them feel powerful and so it's called the superhero shirt and there's a little pocket in the back and you take it out and there's a cape and you attach it to your oh. collar and suddenly you're a superhero and so um, those actually exist on, on Jerry's website and um, and as well as in the book so that was kind of a fun little um, insider Thing that I was able to put in the book. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, next question. With all the traveling that you do, do you have a favorite bookshop somewhere in the world? Um, I do. I do. And, and it's the bookshop of my teenage years. We were living outside Paris and there was an English language or international bookstore right on the banks of the Seine River in the heart of Paris in, in Saint-Michel, the, the neighborhood called Shakespeare and Company. Been there forever. The um, original proprietress was Sylvia Beach and um, it was kind of a place where um, the Bohemians would gather in, you know, in 
the 20s and um, it just had such a magical atmosphere. They sell, I believe, mostly vintage and secondhand books, but I spent many, many pleasurable hours there. So that's kind of my fantasy bookstore. I have a lovely local um, independent bookstore here on Bainbridge Island. It's called Eagle Harbor Book Company. And they've been really supportive. Uh, when somebody orders a, a book to be signed, I can just you know ride my bike up there and sign the book. And so it's, it's, it, that's very fun. I appreciate having the small town bookstore as well. Absolutely, we're big into independent bookshops and trying to support them. Mm -hmm. They seem to be the lifeblood of the community and um, it shouldn't surprise you to know that I'm just finishing the work on my book that will be published next year in 2020 and the title is The Lost and Found Bookshop. Oh, and it's, it's a vintage bookshop in old San Francisco and and um, in the course of the novel, um, they discover, you know, secrets hiding in the walls of this old building. So that's been keeping me very entertained for the last several months. Well, we look forward to seeing that one as well then. Yeah. So um, the next question is ebook, um, physical book or audio book? And second question to that is for audio books, your, your own books, do you read them yourself? Oh, okay. So I, I said my answer to that is all of the, the above. I love ebooks for tra travel and for reading in the dark. So I don't wake my husband up, you know, turning on a light. And I love being able to manipulate the print size, you know, now that I'm of a certain age. So <laughs> I love ebooks for that. And, but a physical book, it, to me, it's just, um, I feel very connected to it and to the text. So I, I love those. And I often will buy different editions for different purposes of the same book. So um, it's not really saving me <laughs> any money to have all these formats. The audio books I love because they keep you company when you're doing something menial, chores, gardening, you know, driving or something. And so I love that. And um, I don't read my audio books. I'm, I'm not a fan of my, the sound of my own voice. Um, and I don't have the voice talent that I think that it takes to have a really good audio production. Like, um, oh, um, they usually are trained actors that read mine. And for the past several books, they've, uh, the publisher has sent me an audio clip of you know several audio clips and they and I have to try to in, um, listen for the voice and the phrasing of the narrator and then you know I get to collaborate on who they hire to narrate the book and so I just uh, the audio book I think will be published on the same day and um, I I love hearing it and that's actually the only way that I reread the books that I've published because when I read a print book that I've published it. I, I don't know, it, it, it feels, I feel like I want to start editing it again and making corrections. But when I listen to somebody reading it, it's like a different art form. So I love that. I think that's, um, that's kind of a really fun moment when I get the audio book and load it up and start listening to somebody else reading my story to me. It just feels really fresh that way. Oh, that's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, I definitely agree that audiobooks, like the voice really has to be spot on. Otherwise, like it's a long book and that voice right. will be with you for a while. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's true. Yep. Um, and I, I think that publishers um, usually do such a good job matching the voice with the material. Um, I, I suppose I, if I'm listening to a memoir, I think I'd like to hear the author reading it. But for a dramatic reading, um, a trained voice talent usually does the trick. Yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a good point. Um, mm -hmm. What is one movie, TV series, or podcast that you're loving right now? What am I loving? Okay, so TV series that I'm loving right now. Um, oh, I mentioned when we came on, I'm... I'm watching um, the entire series of The Handmaid's Tale. It is a dark, dark mm -hmm. journey. <laughs> but it's fascinating to me for a couple of reasons. The very first season um, was fairly faithful to the book I read probably 20 years ago or you know, a long time ago. And um, the way that it was imagined for the small screen 
was just magical to me. I thought, wow, did they ever bring that to life? And then um, because it was so successful, um, I imagine it is in Canada as well, in the States, um, I, I was curious to see how they would continue the story, even though there wasn't, you know, a book as the source material. And so the author, Margaret Atwood, um, um, consulted or, or advised them on subsequent seasons and episodes. And I just thought, wow, what a, what a gratifying process for an author to see her, her story take on a life of its own like that. So I'm fascinated by that. Um, podcasts. I love book podcasts, um, book review podcasts. And I, I'm really bad that the names of them escape me. Um, yeah, but I, but podcasts again are something that keep me company, you know, when I'm doing my chores or whatever. And it's a way to, um, you know, get other people's thoughts on reading. So the podcasts are great. In the States now we're having, you know, quite the news cycle. And so I get my news from podcasts, um, you know, with whatever political slant, you know, they happen to be offering. So yeah, we, we have a lot of forms of entertainment now that just didn't even exist, seems like five minutes ago. Yeah, it's, it's very true. It's like, which one will win today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so my last question for you today is, if you could leave us with a book that you highly recommend, um, it doesn't have to be new, but one that we should all really wow. pick up and put on our to-be-read uh, to list. Oh, well, thank you for asking that. That is a, that's kind of a cool question. And I'm, I'm looking at my shelf of books that I just read. Um, you know what, this one here. Um, this one, it's called Beneath the Tamarind Tree. And it's about, um, it's a, an account of the Boko Haram abduction, abductions of the girls in Nigeria. Oh, wow. it's, so, it's so compelling and it's, it's actually very uplifting. I mean, it's obviously disturbing parts of it, but yeah, Beneath the Tamarind Tree, and I hope I'm saying the author's name right, Isha Sese, I-S-H-A. S-E-S-A-Y, and I, I just found it so compelling, and I'm, I read a, a publisher's preview of it, but I believe it's in print now, so anyway, that one um, is one that I recently finished, and it really kind of stuck with me, and it's, um, you know, how do we take care of women in the world, and I suppose, you know, I kind of had leftover emotions from writing the Oysterville Sewing Circle, and so things that are about women and girls and taking care of each other are just really appealing to me right now, so. There you go. Well, I will put the link in the um, notes um, for this okay. video. So if anybody wants to grab a copy, then we'll sure. they'll be able to do that. But thank you so, so, so much for your time. I want everybody to go out and get this as soon as possible. Oh, you and me both. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it'll be well worth their time. So thank you so much for your time today. And um, good luck with your current writing. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. Okay, same to you, Erin, and sending love all the way across to, to Canada. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.